Um, and of course, our wonderful Celeste Carlisle too. Um, so these are our two main speakers today. Um, Alan has been a research associate and a professor at Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts, but even more than that, he has worked extensively in the realm of animal welfare policy, correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, and educating um, in, that, uh, uh, in that genre, as well as really involved with the development and the execution of fertility control vaccines for wildlife, including wild horses and burros, deer, et cetera, um, and especially where they, they, ha they have conflict in urban areas. So we're really lucky. He's been involved far longer than I have with fertility control and with the wild horse issue. So welcome, Alan Ruppard. I'm really excited. Thank you for your time. Um, Celeste has been our biologist and worked with Return to Freedom since 2005. She was trained by Dr. J. Kirkpatrick, the late Dr. J. Kirkpatrick, who was the director of the Science and Conservation Center in Billings, Montana. And under their guidance, we were the fourth project in the world to um, implement fertility control vaccine, PZP, to manage our wild horses so they could live in natural family bands um, with the stallion and his harem of mares um, without uh, the risk of overpopulation. And so we've been able to do that for over 20, 21 years now and have collected a lot of data. And we've been happy that we've had a 91 to 98% efficacy uh, with the vaccine. And uh, this has been the platform of our educational programs as well as our uh, advocacy efforts. Um, so, We've been committed as an organization to ending roundups uh, for over 22 years and replacing them, hopefully, with humane alternatives that can be managed on the range uh, that are least the least invasive practices that would be available to humans. And that is why fertility control has always been our, our preference. And we have now used it long enough that we have no concerns about the current uh, vaccines that are available. Um, so one of the things that has been always challenging with getting the Bureau of Land Management to utilize fertility control across the range is their, uh, the logistical challenges that they face in some of these very remote areas, especially where the horses are difficult to track and even difficult to find. And sometimes they are even difficult to gather. Unfortunately, with helicopters, humans can be pretty invasive and can get them almost anywhere. But to get in there and dart mares with a vaccine, it, it definitely is challenging. Um, it's, we are still very critical that the BLM could have been utilizing it over the last few decades on, in areas where the horses are more trackable. Uh, especially where you see a lot of photographers that have gone out and made the, um, have the, have the herds are more um, comfortable around humans and used to seeing human beings. Um, and they would have been able to sell, uh, save thousands of lives and certainly millions of dollars over the last 20 something years if they had been using available fertility control vaccines um, during this time. So, but we do understand the challenges. And so, um, you know, one of the things that has happened more recently, I, I know everyone's been aware for the last, since about April in 2019, we have um, observed a lot of misinformation and misguided narrative that has been out there, which has sort of framed some of the work that we've done um, recently in sitting down with public land stakeholders to find viable solutions that were non-lethal. Um, and the reason that that's important is because in 2017, if we remember correctly, and I don't want to make, make light of this, this is really important. In 2017, um, basically, the House of Representatives had all voted to euthanize tens of thousands of wild horses. The population on the range had grown. And whether we agree with BLM's numbers or not, those are the numbers that we all go by. And so with 
the population escalating past 80,000 horses and with Bureau of Land Management having the requirement to manage wild horse and burrow populations on our public land and the goal of setting what's called AML, which is the appropriated management level for those populations. And their goal is set at 27,000, actually 26,900. That's a huge gap. And as the gap continues to get larger because horses are reproducing all the time on the range, the, the controversy continues to grow and it's, it became more and more polarized. So we decided to sit down at the table with the very associations that we completely disagree with, but who have a legal stake to be on our public lands and to utilize our public lands. And that would be, of course, the livestock agencies, hunting associations, um, natural resource energy um, associations. And these were not comfortable conversations to have, but we wanna make it really clear that these are important co conversations to have. This is the conversation to have. These are the people we've been battling for decades. And we had to come to a table and create a respectful conversation so that we could hear each other, that we have to accept that they have a legal right to graze their livestock there. And the livestock, um, industry needs to accept that the horse, our sentiment towards the horses. Um, this is a, a long conversation and um, it needed to start. And this is just the beginning of the conversation. And we wanna make it really clear that whatever we've been lobbying for or fighting for for the last 22 years was brought into these conversations. No one went, the ASPCA, the Humane Society of the United States, Return to Freedom, did not go in a room and cut a deal, there's no deal. No one's getting paid off. Um, <laughs> we're, we're fighting for the protections of our wild horses and burrows and to prevent a lethal alternative, which is what had been presented in 2017. The House had voted to euthanize tens of thousands of wild horses. Luckily, the Senate did not, but they sent a very clear message to all of us uh, that something had to be done soon. Uh, things needed to change and that we needed to involve the stakeholders that are on the opposite side of this issue and find a way that we could all come to the table with, with a compromise or something that we all agree on. Um, and Return to Freedom wanted to be in this conversation. Um, we've been able to move the needle. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in some areas, but there's so much more work to do. These are not easy conversations. This is a very complicated, um, these are complicated policies that govern our public lands. And to make the kinds of changes that we want to see would require dismantling uh, Western rangeland policies. And that's, that's, that's a pretty long battle. So the horses don't have that kind of time, especially now with climate change and um, politics, economics, all of it, it all threatens the survival of our wild horses. So we are, we continue to look for solutions that we can get support for from a diverse group of stakeholders. And one of the main, uh, obviously for us is to ask Congress to continually hold BLM accountable to implement available fertility control vaccines and um, non-lethal solutions to keep the horses out of harm's way on and off the range. So I'm gonna let these two scientists dig in a little bit to give you an idea, a sense of how complicated it can be when you really dig into management because it's not a very sexy conversation. It's sexier to talk about ending roundups and stopping roundups and saving the horses and wild horses running free. And um, right now, um, we hope that we can give you a little foundation uh, of what it looks like to actually dig in to the reality of managing wild horse populations on the range, giving the complexity of and the logistics of the issue um, and the uh, landscape. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Celeste Carlisle. Hi, thank you, Netta. Um, that was a, a rich introduction uh, that I think sort of lends 
um, to the challenges of, of a lot of different layers. Um, I'm just going to talk for a few slides, which I cannot advance right now. Um, here we go. Um, about why we, uh, why we need to do this, why we need to be thoughtful about this. Um, and then Alan is going to um, give us some, Dr. Rutberg is going to give us some real world stories. <laughs> um, so why do wild horses have to be managed? We, we like to think that our systems are sort of doing a good job uh, allowing nature to take care of itself. Um, but if we want to care about these wild horses, we have to care about the land on which they live and the land they need to thrive and survive on. Um, and where do they live? Wild horses have been, I mean, they're relegated to land set in, in many cases, not all, are high desert ecosystems, which are relatively fragile ecosystems. And they're on Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, National Park Service, private and tribal lands. Of course, we tend to focus um, our work on the Bureau of Land Management because it is responsible for managing the highest number of horses. Um, but horses don't really know where those dividing lines are. Um, and they oftentimes wander off of their established areas. Um, these lands are dry, arid Western landscapes. Again, primarily high desert and primarily uh, sagebrush steppe ecosystems. Um, in, ecos in, in ecology, we look at systems and uh, talk about whether they are resilient or resistant. And resistant means, I mean, they're pretty straightforward. Resistant means able to sort of handle um, what, what could be catastrophic change or, or even mild changes. And resili uh, resiliency uh, refers to their ability, ability to bounce back from any sort of damage that has occurred to that system. And that damage can run the gamut, uh, overgrazing, uh, drought, um, building of a road, a, a lots of things that are going to impact a system. In the arid west where these horses are found, resiliency and resistance of those ecosystems is very, very low. Um, so our ability to be able to restore these systems is, is not so easy and takes long, long periods of time. Um, so those are things that we have to think about when we think about the multi-uses on these public lands and when we think about the fact that the horses are sort of in portions of these lands that are particularly challenging. Um, if we want land that will sustain them in a changing climate, we have to think about how that changing climate is going to mean that things are no longer what they were 50 years ago when the act happened. Um, and I, I need you all to know that I'm not saying this to say, oh my gosh, there shouldn't be any, <laughs> any use on those public lands anymore. I'm saying this because that's one of the things we have to consider when we look at what we can do that's really going to benefit those horses that are out there for the long term and in a sustainable fashion. Um, so if we want to do the things uh, that are listed on this slide, like having lands that support those horses and the ecosystem around those horses, we also have to think about how that's happening in a changing environment, quite literally. Um, and again, it's important to point out that these, uh, the, the majority of these lands that horses are on and all of the lands on which they are federally protected are multi-use lands. Um, we didn't make them that way. It doesn't mean that we like every use that's out there, but that is within which, the, the context within which we, we must work, obviously. Um, so we wanted to really understand this at a deeper level. Um, Return to Freedom has always advocated for non-lethal management. Um, but if when we think about that, the, the Wild and Free Roaming Horse and Burrow Act does allow for euthanasia and for sales without restriction. But the majority of American people are not terribly wild about that idea. Certainly Return to Freedom is not wild about that idea at all. But if we want to advocate for non-lethal management, we needed to really deeply understand what that meant. Um, so we wanted to look at how long that would take. We wanted to look at what has to happen so that non-lethal management becomes the paradigm. We wanted to look at what we would need to have in place 
And then we wanted to look at the most, I think, sort of boring part, which was, is it economically viable? Those are scary things to look at, I got to say, because these are big numbers we're talking about. Um, and again, we're talking within multiple use and that the, the BLM's budget overall is one thing. The Wild Horse and Burrow Program budget is still another. So to, term, to determine those things, we really had to take a deep dive into real analytics and real data. And we did a series of science-based science um, ecologic modeling to look at what happens to populations over time when you lay different types of management techniques over them. And um, I need to say again that this is, this is a big view. This is the 20,000 foot view. This is not a step-by-step, -step. this is exactly how it should be done view. This is to give us as advocates of horses on our public lands the deep knowledge we need to be able to have really meaningful discussions with the agencies that manage these animals. Um, so through many, many, many uh, peer-reviewed journal articles and statistics uh, and data websites that uh, the agencies keep and through many phone calls to lots of different people within and without these, uh, of these agencies who had this data, um, we put together a pretty comprehensive but rough view of how all of these things affect each other. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick uh, background on why we do modeling, why we look at what these patterns might be. And it's basically to guide our understanding of how our actions are going to affect an outcome. So we might think that uh, applying one type of management is going to result in, you know, result number one. But if we model through that and really look at those numbers and how they operate off of each other, we might see something different that might change our, our objectives or our, or our management overall. So we want it, it basically gives us a good idea of where we're going. It also helps us to learn system, something about system dynamics. What are the most important inputs into a system? What is giving you a greater return or a lesser return? And it also can tell you how a system might respond. Um, so again, what you think will work um, and what is shown to work, they might be the same, but they might completely be at odds. So we have to really understand that when we're looking at really complicated layered management. Finally, when we, when we look at what could be non-lethal sustainable management, we need to think about what's economically efficient. I think those of us that are supportive of fertility control and wildlife have always just sort of felt like it seems the most economically efficient way to manage, but we wanted to really dig in and see if that was true. Um, so I'll give you a hint, it, it is true. Uh, but it's really nice to have the data behind us to prove that point, especially when you're dealing with bureaucracy, agencies, and Congress. Um, so this is why we wanted to dig a little bit more about why we wanted to dig into this. Um, and in other words, why cost matters. Um, so this is a graph. Um, but first, let me back up a second. We, I think we're all aware that the BLM manages wild horses and burros by looking at a, a specified area, a herd management area, and determining what the carrying capacity of that range will be. In other words, how many animals can be there uh, in perpetuity? How many can uh, utilize the forage and the water resources that are there right now? Um, and so once they've determined that, they remove whatever is considered excess. These gather removals uh, just continue. Um, if you gather and remove animals, but you leave animals behind, those animals continue to reproduce. So what has happened is that if we look at this graph um, on the left-hand side, we see this is the percent of the annual wild horse and burrow program budget that was applied to fertility control. Um, and you see that it, it just one year got close to 4% of that budget, which is not a lot of that budget. Uh, but we also see that those uh, across the bottom are the years. This is the only data I can find was from 2006 to 2000, which is about 2017. Uh, but this, gra this uh, pattern continues for the next couple of years in this same, uh, this same slope of line. Basically what we're seeing is that the 
black dots are the total population of animals on the range. And we're seeing that those gray bars, which are representing the percent of the budget that's allocated to fertility control, uh, are never very high and in fact decrease. So our population continues to go up on the range, but less and less percentage of a budget is applied towards controlling the reproduction of those animals. Um, but we have to say also in understanding the whole story um, is that there's not a lot of money for fertility control if a lot of those animals pulled off the range are then housed and fed and cared for that is where your budget goes. Um, so trying to figure out how to manage that whole system uh, means looking at things a lot more comprehensively and getting a lot more confused, quite frankly. All right, this is my uh, last little part. There's a lot to explain here. Um, so again, if we look at that last slide, we have to take into account some of the limitations that the agencies really are up against if we want to think about how to uh, help get around those challenges and actually work towards sustainable management. Um, some of those limitations exist because for so many years, uh, populations of horses have, have not been managed well. They continue to grow on the range. Um, so we have a lot of horses in holding facilities. We have only so many contractors that can go out and do the work that needs to be done, managing, applying fertility control, taking care of horses and holding facilities. And again, I need to remind everybody, I'm not saying these things because I think this is the best way to do them. I'm saying these things because these are what we must consider when we look at management. Um, and another thing about BLM that we'll cover, and this is not to just keep slamming these agencies, but it is a giant bureaucracy. Uh, the communication dysfunction and the chronic vacancy rate in some of these positions at the organization that is responsible for managing these horses um, makes it very difficult uh, to engage in sustainable management activities. Uh, there is a lot of dysfunction within large bureaucracies. And we also have regional politics to take into consideration, and we also have changing conditions on the range, which we touched on a little bit with climate change. Um, so if we want non-lethal sustainable management, uh, that won't happen overnight, unfortunately. Um, and here's a little model um, that just illustrates how we need to think about these things. This is not a model saying this is what you do exactly. Um, um, this is a model to help us identify which variables are going to help us get, um, get to sustainable management the most efficiently. Um, and it helps us figure out what matters most. So you can't just kind of run a model and throw numbers down on a page and say, oh, we got it, that's it, we know our answer now. You also continue along the way to check your outcomes and to compare what you've modeled with real empirical data, which, which Dr. Rutberg is gonna talk about in just about one minute, um, and see where you need to tweak things. And that, in, in a nutshell, is what best management practices are supposed to be. You're learning along the way, you're changing your system. You have a framework in place. That's what models are good for. That's what we've been looking at for several years now. But then you keep working on them. And of course, you fit them to each herd management area. Um, policy decisions are made um, on more than just the basis of scientific understanding. Science may guide our decision making or give us an understanding of system dynamics. Um, and allows us to make predictions, but ultimately making policy is a human decision. So I'm just gonna give you this as an example because this shows sort of how it helps us to think about this. Um, and this is a graph that shows, let's say that you've got a thousand horses in, in the Celeste Carlisle herd management area. And, um, but conditions out there aren't so great and you know that 500 uh, is a number that could be supported on the Celeste Carlisle herd management area. So if you did nothing and you just allowed those horses to be there at a 20% growth rate, which is that black line, you could see that, you know, obviously your populations are going to continue to grow. If you did what is essentially the Bureau of Land Management's management strategy, you would just gather and remove uh, additional animals every three to four years back down to what you thought your uh, your range could handle 
And you can see from that red line, which is gathering about 500 every three or four years, that basically you, you just chase your tail forever and ever. You may get down to a number that you feel your range can handle, but then you're leaving animals on the range that are repopulating. And so you just go on and on forever, which means horses go into long-term holding facilities forever, which means you never, you never accomplish anything. You could also just apply fertility control. So that's our green line on this graph. And if you were applying fertility control really, really well, you were, these animals were super easy to access and you were going out onto the range and they let you dart them from, uh, from walking around on foot with your dart projectors and you were getting about 90% of your mares and you were doing a great job, you would be able to begin to drop the population. But we see that um, even at about 10 years, you still haven't dropped your population to a number that you think your range can, can handle. And so we get to the blue line, which is a tough nut to swallow, quite frankly. And we see that if you did some gathers and removals and you were applying fertility control, you could drop your population more quickly and you could then stabilize it and you can even see that you drop, if you kept on doing it, you would drop below what your target had been. Again, a reminder, this is a model to help us wrap our heads around how these things work. Does the blue line mean that's what we're gonna do forever and ever and ever at the Celeste Carlisle Herd Management Area? Absolutely not. But this gives us an idea of what different management techniques might work together. In a best case scenario, of course, you would want to make sure that you were managing so that you were gathering the least amount and applying fertility control to the most amount in this particular situation so that you were not having to gather and remove so many and so that you were achieving stabilized populations that you could then manage with fertility control much more easily and efficiently. Um, so again, I'll just end with the caveat that these are management options. Um, and we are all of, of, you know, representing many different stakeholders in these management actions on our public lands. So we don't necessarily need or want to agree with every portion of this, but we need to deeply understand how things function so that we can be really educated advocates for what we would like to see happening on our public lands, uh, which is, of course, increased fertility control, because if animals are populating our repopulating on the range, that is what you should be um, addressing. Um, and so with that, I am going to hand it off to Dr. Rutberg to talk about some things that actually happen in the real world. Thank you, Celeste. Um, not ready. There we go. Um, just before we start, um, I'm, I'm on the East Coast. It's dark. We're in the middle of a storm that has already knocked the power at once and hopefully it'll it, it it will keep me here for another 20 minutes or so um i also have a very insecure cat who may come up and pester me because it does not like storm so um before uh, i want to start by saying that i've been involved with wild horses and wild horse management and wild horse advocacy for over 30 years and one of the things i've learned is that the system is pretty well set up to stop things you don't like. And so there have been plenty of opportunities to um, take BLM to court or to muster public opinion to stop really egregious wrongs. And there have been plenty of egregious wrongs over the years. Um, but it's much, much harder to participate in a process that's going to actually solve a problem or reach a positive solution that will end up with fewer really, really bad things going on. And so I really have to credit Netta and Return to Freedom with, with the courage of, of following that path and not taking the easier route of just stopping things that, that, um, that we don't want to see. And of course, they're doing that as well. But um, this is a pretty brave thing to do. And so I really appreciate that, that Netta and Return to Freedom have assigned onto this approach and and celeste has pushed that approach on the wild horse and burrow advisory board um so celeste has shown you some models 
and um, and it gives sort of a general idea of how things would work in a in an Excel spreadsheet kind of way. Um, but we do actually have some real world experience working with contraceptives in the field and looking at population effects and what you have to accomplish to reduce a population. Um, and I actually did um, get my start with wild horses on acetique in the late 1980s and uh, first encountered J. Kirkpatrick, who, uh, who Netta um, referred to before with the appropriate level of reverence, and uh, Dr. John Turner, who was his partner at the time and who I continue to work with and we'll mention again in a little bit. Um, but Acetig um, is really a model in many senses. And um, it's a model first because the National Park Service there um, found itself with a problem and didn't want to use a conventional solution. They didn't want to get into the roundup business. Um, but they, but as Teague is has been occupied by wild horses since probably the late 17th century. Um, and the population on Assateague, um, once the park was established in the mid 1960s, grew very steadily. And it's a barrier island. And so the vegetation is very delicate. They've got dune grasses and they've got marsh and, and all kinds of things where a lot of horses can, can really have an impact on the ecosystem. Um, and so in the late 1980s, um, the Park Service invited uh, Jay and John in um, to see if they could control the horse populations there without touching them, without gathering them, the most uninvasive way that they could possibly do it. Um, and they went through a series of, of experiments with, with different contraceptives. And the one that worked was PZP which Anetta has described before. So it's, it's a vaccine, it's a protein, um, and it's deliverable to horses by dart. If you can get close to them, and I've got a little inset there of acetate taken, I think that was summer 2017. You can get pretty close to a lot of horses on, on acetate and they're not always that easy to get to. Um, they'll spend time out on the marsh pretty far away. But the point is that they're all approachable, potentially. Um, and so Jay and John started treating horses with PZP in 1988 and showed well, on their little sample that um, it was roughly 95% effective. And the thing about that vaccine, though, is that they had to give two initial shots and then annual boosters. And as long as you could do that, you could really control the reproduction of the herd. In 1994, the National Park Service decided to do that and went to the public, um, provided a transparent and spirited discussion of how they should control their, their horses. Um, and the public bought into it. And so starting in 1994, they started to manage their herd exclusively with contraception, with PZP. Um, and so they put in place a management plan, um, which, which had all, all mares being treated with PZP once they hit the age of two, and then they were allowed to have a foal. And then after they had a foal, they, um, they were put back on PZP, which is a pretty stringent management plan. And it does require you, you to be able to get to essentially all mares every year. Um, but even under that circumstance, it took them essentially 10 years for populations to start to decline. So they stayed stable. And the reason they stayed stable is that um, mares that were not having foals because they'd been contraceptive um, lived a really long time. So instead of dying in their sort of mid to late teens, um, it's pretty common on Asfig even now to have, have mares uh, in their late 20s and early 30s. Um, so because they lived so long, they did not see a population effect right away. But as they continued the model, um, after 10 years, they got a slow and steady decline in the population um, until they hit their target, which is now between about 80 and 100. This slide stops at about um, 2012. But um, they've continued to do it. They've, for the most part, have now, because they've hit their goal, they stopped treating horses. Um, and so again, they were persistent. They were transparent. Um, they 
did their paperwork, they got the public involved, and they do a very, very good job of educating the public about what they're doing. And that stabilization and decline happened without any removals at all. So in a way, that's sort of the ideal that, um, that we would all like to see happen everywhere. Celeste, next slide. But this really bothers the BLM because most of their land doesn't look like Assateague. And most of their land, or a lot of their land looks like that. That happens to be Cedar Mountain Herd Management Area in Utah, which is a large but not huge herd management area. Um, it's about 643 square miles, which is a pretty big piece of turf compared to about 25 or 30 in Assateague. Um, and the horses there are really different. They're not used to seeing people. And when they do see people, especially walking around, it makes them really nervous. And so the, uh, the shot of the horses on the right, they're about a quarter mile away from us and they're all looking at us and they're all nervous. And in, in a place like Cedar Mountains, you can't dart horses every year, certainly, and you probably can't dart them at all. Um, and there's a significant number of herd management areas, maybe 15% of, of the BLM's herd management areas where you could dart horses, but a lot of them you really can't. Um, and so the vaccine that we used on acetique, which required yearly treatments, um, doesn't really work in that situation because you just don't have that kind of access to the animals. So we had to find a different approach. Celeste? So the solution we came to after about 10 years of research was a version of PZP, which includes the original liquid vaccine, but added to the original liquid vaccine is a series of time release pellets uh, of the sort that, that is commonly used in, in medicine, except instead of being good for 12 hours, this is, these pellets were engineered to release at one month, three months, and 12 months, essentially to simulate the kinds of boosters that you would be able to actually inject into a, a mare at a place like Asti, but which you can at a place like Cedar Mountain. And so um, we were able to show that this vaccine, after again a bunch of a bunch of field research and and lab research with Dr. Irwin Liu at University of California Davis, is that this works this works pretty well. So next slide. So with a single shot of the PZP22, we've been able to get about an 85% reduction in the first year, and a 60 some percent reduction in the second year, on average. Um, and that's varied a little bit from site to site. It's been a little bit complicated um, because of the specific timing of the time release um, pellets. Um, it's really optimized to be used in December through February, or it can be used a little bit later, but the er earlier timeframes don't work very well. So anyway, um, it does work pretty well. That's, that is the time of year when there are a lot of um, a lot of opportunities for gathers. Um, and so what we also learned is that if you give them a second shot, give them a booster in either the second or third year, um, that will add another three to four years of effectiveness. And it doesn't ma actually matter which of the vaccines we use, um, either the PZP22 vaccine or the original Assateague Return to Freedom boosters work equally well and will give us a bunch more years with a single shot. Um, the other thing we've learned is that you can give those PZP22 treatments with the, with the liquid and with the pellets, either by hand or by dart. And so it has, it has a lot of potential there. Um, next slide. Okay. So this, a lot of the, the vaccine effectiveness stuff was really worked out between 10 and 15 years ago. Uh, the booster st booster shot stuff is a little new, a little bit newer, um, but we were really interested in finding out what kind of population effects we could see in in some challenging herds, so that the BLM couldn't say, "Well, that's just acetic, and this isn't like most of the herds." Cedar Mountains is pretty difficult, and so um, 
So there and at another site, Sandwash Basin in, in Colorado, um, we administered PZP-22 at gathers. And so they had two gathers that we were involved with, one in December 2009 and a second one in February 2012, which is um, uh, two and a half years later. So um, here was the issue. So the December 2009 gather was not terrific, which is to say they left half the mares on the range. And so after the removal, we treated the remaining half of the mares that they'd actually gathered with PZP-22 and released them. But what that meant was that only half the mares on the range had been treated with contraceptives and the other half were breeding freely. So they did a better job in February 2012. So they got close to 70% of the mares on the range, which were then treated with PZP-22. Actually, some of them were boosted because they, um, they got some of the 2009 animals and then about 60% of the animals that we treated were new animals. And so what we found after 2012 was a pretty dramatic drop in population growth rate. So next slide. There we go. Okay, so the blue line is the number of horses on Cedar Mountain. The gray line is the population growth rate, which ties to the axis on the right. So the average population growth in this herd, if it's not being managed, is more than 20%. It's probably 23 plus percent. So that's a pretty rapidly growing herd. Uh, what we found after the initial treatments is that we got a pretty modest reduction in population growth rate. We got a 15% reduction in the first or 15% annual growth in the first year, which is okay, but not what they're looking for for management. In the second year, the vaccine didn't work all that well, and it, it worked even less. So by the third year, um, by 2012, the population growth rate was pretty close to the maximum. But in the second round of gathers, once we had 70% of the mares treated, including a bunch who were boosted, we got a very dramatic reduction in population growth rate. So in that year, in 2013, following the 2012 treatments, population growth was only 5%. So that's, le that's a, less than a quarter of what would be normal. And that's something that would make a huge difference. And it snuck up in, in subsequent years. But with some improvements with vaccine, the vaccine and with meticulous and responsible and thorough gathers where the get the where the contractors will get 70 or 80 percent of the mares on the range you can make a huge difference right and so if you notice again following the blue line it's pretty stable between 2011 and 2013 there's only a very modest increase in population growth over those years and so that's our goal that's what we want to happen all the time next slide So we have this vaccine that with essentially two preparation, two treatments, two to three years apart, we can get anywhere between five and seven years of effective contraception, which is awesome. And it now becomes something that is not just for an absentee kind of place, but for a place where you can access the horses every three or four years. Um, and so we did a little bit of database modeling of the management assuming that we could get 80% of the mares at each gather with half of them being removed and half of them being released with PZP-22 treatments. And this is something that John Turner and his, did in his lab, using data from the Cedars and, um, and from other, other sites we've actually worked. So next slide. So this is what it looks like. If you're gathering every four years, and you don't treat with PZP. You get those big jagged peaks every four years. You remove a bunch of horses, it goes up. You remove a bunch of horses, it goes down, and then it goes up again. And this is very similar to what um, Celeste was showing before with her, her modeling. 
you get the same trend with treated mirrors, but it's much less dramatic. And so they don't go up as fast, they don't go down as fast. And what that means is that you are taking fewer mares off the range or fewer animals off the range. And so you're not contributing to the surplus of animals that would then have to go to long-term or short-term holding facilities or adoptions. You're taking fewer horses off. You're leaving more horses on the range, which is the ultimate objective here because we want to not break up families and social groups. We are saving money because um, as, as you know, housing a horse for 20 or 25 years on a private facility is very expensive. Um, and we're also helping the range because on average, there are going to be fewer horses impacting the range. So sort of if you look across, the more horses are on the range, the more they're eating. And so there's going to be less strain, less stress on the range and more of the resilience that, um, that, that Celeste was referring to before. So this is a realistic scenario that's based on data. It's not a miracle, um, but it's something that will help a lot. Next slide. So this is what we've learned having done, been working on this for 20 some years. Um, first of all, I talked about gathers here. Um, there are some places where gathers are gonna be necessary. There are some places where that we may be able to do this with bay trapping. There are some places where you can do it with darting. Um, the point is that every HMA is going to have its own challenges. It's going to, it's going to be, depend on the behavior of the horses, really how this thing is delivered. And the local managers, the HMA managers, will have to figure out how to do this best in their own site. And in many places, you're going to need both removals and fertility control. Um, but you have to do both at the same time. For this technology has been available in some form or another for 20 or 25 years. And the mantra from the BLM has always been, well, fertility control is great, but you can only stabilize populations with it. So we're gonna remove down to AML first and then use fertility control. Um, we now know by much historical experience that that approach doesn't work. It can work sometimes for a short time, but then there's always something that happens. There's fires and there have to, do, there have to be emergency gathers somewhere. There's a change in administration. There are budget cuts. There's a recession. There are all kinds of things that prevent BLM from following its schedules precisely. And what the fertility control will do is it provides a buffer. It provides a resilience in the herd so that if you don't follow your schedule for a few years, the horse herds won't get crazy out of control right away. Um, and so we, we know that removing to fertility, removing to AML and, and then using fertility control doesn't work. They have to, BLM has to start using fertility control right away. Another piece of this is that persistence is necessary. It didn't work in the very well in our first trial on the cedars. It took the second, second cycle of gathers. So there's going to have to be planning, there's going to have to be persistence. And that's something that ACT has done supremely well. They really have persisted for 30 years in maintaining their approach. And it's worked there, um, but it's taken some, some purpose and some consistency in terms of getting their horse population in a place that's consistent with the condition of their, of their land there. But I wanna stress that however it's done, it is possible to use fertility control humanely and effectively to control wild horse populations on BLM land, which will benefit the horses, will benefit the range. So last slide for me. Okay, whoops, I, did you miss one? That was, that was your last slide. Okay, good. This is, no, this is my slide. Oh wait. That's your slide. This is my slide. That's your slide, go ahead. 
Thank you, Dr. Rutberg. <laughs> Can you tell we practiced really hard? Um, I just have one more thing uh, to sort of wrap all of that up, um, and then I'm going to hand it off to Netta to close. Um, but when we look at what the tenets of a sustainable plan would be, these are sort of four different tiers listed on this slide that need to operate together. Are these tiers perfect? No way. Do we like all of these tiers? Not necessarily, or we may like them at different levels. But when we look at how uh, we, we are demanding that our public resource agencies manage comprehensively, we are trying to take a step back and also look at what comprehensive management would mean. Um, and so no matter how hard we wish for something to be a different way, these are things that could operate together to get us to a place of sustainability. I'm just going to explain them a little tiny bit. Um, but we need to think of the Wild Horse and Burrow program as an ecosystem in and of itself. And we need to address the different tiers of that system. And so if we did these things together, we would get to a point where um, where we could phase out long-term holding. If you phase out long-term holding, which is what the current, uh, about 70% of the current wild horse and burrow program budget goes towards that, you would free up funds that would be useful for far more uh, humane, effective, on-range paradigms and including habitat restoration. So we've got to get to that point, um, not to mention then we're not housing, warehousing horses and separating them from their families and all of the rest. Um, but again, these things won't happen overnight. And so we see things like targeted gather removals, and that puts us in a very uncomfortable situation. Some of this data analysis has been incredibly inconvenient <laughs> to really figure out what it means, but it does give us uh, a more rooted place to operate from to actually discover what these sustainable management paradigms will be and then helps us to operate within the real world of bureaucrats and, and Congress and changing administrations and advocacy groups and multi-use stakeholders on those public lands to actually get somewhere. Um, that's exciting. Uh, when you lay it all out, it, it's a little uh, dreary. Um, and you're getting down into weeds that are really complicated to work through. But it is pushing us down the line further than we've ever been before. Um, so we are excited about this. Um, so that's sort of my, um, my wrap up to say we have to think comprehensively as well. Um, and Netta, you are going to need to jump back on now uh, to close us out uh, with this final. Uh, almost final slide. Okay, I am going to look at my notes now because <laughs> I couldn't find them. Um, yeah, I think one of the biggest things is that uh, appropriated management level or the target of population for each each herd management area or ecosystem um, is is has got to be managed and looked at scientifically and analyzed properly and stay current. And that hasn't been happening. And I think, um, you know, back in um, 2007, the Bureau of Land Management was so close. They were within a few thousand horses to their target population goal, which, you know, they were at about 32,000 horses. And so that would have been a really great time for them to have really implemented uh, a strong, robust fertility control program across the West. Um, because as the population continues to grow and horses reproduce on the range, the amount of horses that will suffer roundups and holding and end up in the wrong hands only increases. So that is why we keep saying they need to start now. We've been saying that for 20 years, but they need to start now. They can't keep kicking the can down the road. So that's that's really important. And um, so we decided, of course, that we, of course we want to stop all the roundups, but that hasn't got us very far over the years. Once in a while, we can delay one, but they continue anyway. 
and then more horses suffer. So we wanted to look at how do we end roundups? How do we end them as the main management tool? This is like over 50 years of um, a management paradigm that we need to change. And we can't just flip a switch. So it is gonna take time. And despite political and climatic challenges, the wild horses and burrows can be managed on the range in a humane and a sustainable way. Um, it's, it is gonna take time and it's not easy. And we want them to range freely in, in diversity and in their harem bands and their natural, in natural selection um, on our public lands for future generations, obviously. There's no easy answers to this issue after years of mismanagement and political stalemate, but one thing's for certain that dialogue with all stakeholders is necessary um, for solutions, for real solutions that will truly protect wild horses now and in the long run, both on and, and off the range. Conservation efforts globally are moving towards collaboration and the sharing of expertise. And critical to, critical to the success of this emerging culture are the, the coalescing of groups with divergent points of view, backgrounds, and goals, and different agendas. Um, it's the only way it's going to work. Obviously, you see it with this issue, but you see it with all issues you know, around the globe. Such relationships are vital to finding solutions as the effects of climate change accelerate, uh, which imperil habitats and the species that rely on them including wild horses and including us. Large mammals are gonna be going through a lot of struggles in the coming years and they, they do periodically. And uh, you can definitely see, um, I see the wild horses and burrows as sort of the canaries in the coal mine. Um, but I do wanna say that as a result of some of the respectful dialogue that has been developed over the last few years, we have made some progress. Um, in part because of this, uh, the willingness for stakeholders to sit down and talk, we have been able to make some changes um, for the better. Um, in 2018, uh, BLM revoked their sales policy, which uh, the change that they had made, which allowed a single buyer to purchase up to 24 wild horses a day for as little as a dollar each with no waiting period and no questions asked. So we got that. Uh, reduced back to the original, although not perfect, but where there is now some restrictions in the sale, um, the sales of wild horses, and um, I think it's every six months they can up, they can buy up to four. Um, is, is it perfect? No. Do, would we like to end sale authority? Yes. Um, powerful livestock associations that until recently were lobbying against fertility control. Um, as an option on the range for the, and they were lobbying for the use of lethal tools and roundups, capture and removal as the only available options are now supporting the use of fertility control because of the science that, and the math that we've been able to lay out with our colleagues. Um, and they see its value as a prioritized and necessary tool that would be viable. In 2017, the National Wild Horse and Brew Advisory Board almost unanimous, unanimously voted for mass euthanasia, which as Celeste said, is within the Wild Horse and Brew Act. And in 2018, Celeste joined this advisory board. And um, really, um, I have to just honor her for this is just who she is. She really helped to develop conversations that happen at lunch breaks or, you know, um, different times to build trust and communication with key stakeholder members. And uh, they've been able to move the advisory board to improve the way they work together. And in 2020, recommended expanding fertility control implementation and to develop measurable objectives, outlining a targeted reproductive growth rate reduction. And this is really important, I'm real happy about this, and multi-year plans for an on a uh, herd management area by herd management area basis. Um, so that's really important. Um, they rec the recommendations included that BLM needs to use fertility control immediately, even in those areas where they know they won't get down to AML. So AML, appropriated management level, this is really important. Um, 
they kept using the excuse, kicking the can down the road for so many years that they didn't want to start using fertility control until they got to AML. It's highly doubtful that they'll ever be able to get to AML. Um, and as uh, Dr. Ruppert pointed out, you don't want to get to AML. Um, so we continue to have that conversation to try to <laughs> shift the conversation to you know, increase AML for horses and give horses a fair share of the range. Um, but even then, we still have to look at analyzing these ecosystems, they're very sensitive habitats, and to have really well thought out um, management plans. I mean, just as if you have a, on a ranch um, or a sanctuary, you need to look at things in that way. Um, animals need to be moving for the soil to remain healthy and alive. And there's just a, a lot of um, unbalance that's, ha that have, that's happened on our ranges. And of course, a lack of large predators to, to help manage population for large mammals. Um, so Congress did embrace the framework, the concept, and they did appropriate $21 million in a, additional funds to BLM for this fiscal year, um, but only if the agency put forward a detailed plan for its use. And so far they haven't, but um, they, Congress is supporting a non-lethal path forward. And they are supporting the fact that diverse stakeholders that don't agree with each other, but are lobbying hard on different sides of this issue are talking. And that has made a huge um, impact. Um, in our advocacy work and, and our lobbying efforts on the Hill. You may not see it reflected on social media where there's a lot of noise and emotion, um, but uh, in legislative offices and lobbying efforts and um, on the Hill, basically, you, you definitely um, hear things are shifting, um, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so for this alternative to succeed, Congress must provide BLM with a solid continuing budget, budget, but also vigilant oversight so they don't misuse the funds. Um, we, we hope everybody will work together to ensure that the additional funds are used to implement existing proven safe and effective fertility control vaccines that are available now, uh, slow reproduction humanely on the range until longer acting vaccines are available, forge increased public-private partnerships and restore damaged rangelands. These are all really, I think these are components of the path forward that we can all work together on. Um, just hope everybody understands that we are in the room and we are fighting for the horses all the time. We don't burn bridges, we're trying to build them. We challenge AML which is a complex and volatile issue. Um, RTF does stand firm against the invasive surgical sterilization of mares, and we remain vigilant in meetings opposing this and other potentially harmful management tools that do come up. Um, we are fighting and we don't get everything we want, but things could have been worse and there's still a lot more work to do. So uh, I know that a lot of the people on this webinar today are supporting Return to Freedom's efforts, um, but I just want you to know that we haven't changed. We haven't sold the horses out. We never will. We're always gonna um, I'm gonna uh, We're gonna fight for them. We're never gonna give up. Um, but we want to be involved in these difficult discussions. It's important. Um, you just can't we we don't get everything we want. If we ruled the world, we could, but we're working really hard to make positive changes. Um, so what you can do, do you wanna to go to the next slide? Okay. It's, it's easier to read it. So we're gonna leave this slide up for a while, but this is what you can do. And your voice matters, everybody's voice matters. These are our public lands. And um, we need, you need your representatives to hear you on a consistent basis. Corey, did you wanna talk about this? Sure, I can walk, walk people through these really quickly. Okay, hang, um, on. hang on, let me just introduce, Corey is our advocacy, 
coordinator and he's amazing and he's the person who digs down and, and does a lot of the uh, amazing writing and alerts that you uh, read. So if you haven't signed up already, please be, um, please sign up to receive our e-news. So um, to take action about some of the things that you've heard about today, there is a post on our homepage at returntofreedom.org called Eight Ways You Can Help America's Horses. It includes things like supporting use of fertility control, um, opposing surgical sterilization, supporting the safe act of bay on horse slaughter, other things that are related uh, to the wild horse issue and to horses in general. Um, also with that same post, you can make a donation to our Wild Horse Defense Fund, which is what fuels our lobbying, our grassroots advocacy, and social media work, um, selective litigation. Um, as Netta said, please follow us on social media, uh, whether that's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, your platform of choice. Um, we are at Return to Freedom. Um, please share our posts with your network of friends and family. Um, it's the best way to, to get the word out, really. And um, lastly, if you've enjoyed, and we still have questions yet to go, but if you've enjoyed today's webinar and you appreciate what we do, um, please consider making a donation tomorrow, which is um, Giving Tuesday. And you can find more information about Giving Tuesday on our home book, on our homepage, or on Facebook. Thank you very much.